I do get a feeling when I, well, particularly when I read your work, there is something in it that when I speak it out loud, there is... The only way I can describe it is I used to be in a band and sometimes oh. when, you, when you rehearse with a band and there may be like only four of you, but when it goes really well, it's like there's an extra person in the room. When you do a tune particularly well, it's like there's something else extra here. And I get that same feeling when I read your work is that I do it and it's like, no, there's something else here. I don't know what it is or where it's coming from. And it, and it just brings more to it. And I don't know what that is. That's the only way I can describe it. Because I'm not particularly spiritual. But there is, it just feels like there's an extra thing there, whatever it is. Yeah. What a lovely thing to have said. You saw the mists of that many seagull shore cross which she fled in olden time. And before all that, O windy spirit thou, before she fled, an ordinary girl she was, before, and not afraid. In a magic world she was. She would sit silent there, feeling the clouds, the sky, numbering the moons of Jupiter, fires of the stars, the winds of heaven. She leaped and sang as she flew through heather-scented fragrant air, blown sound from storm-driven waves, fighting and delight the headstrong wind. Ah, joy it was to be alive. You saw, did not forget. Ruth Finnegan, you are a poet, an award-winning author, screenwriter, anthropologist, respected professor. There is so much to talk about. Let's start at the very, very beginning, before we even get into the audiobooks we've worked on together. You were born on New Year's Eve 1933. I just didn't quite make 1934. <laughs> and I'm usually in a hurry. <laughs> that was in Northern Ireland. In Derry. Oh, so what was your childhood like? Oh, magical. The most, well, Derry is a wonderful city. I mean, it was very fraught. Now it is amazing, the Peace Bridge. <laughs> you almost can't believe it. Um, but really the magical, enchanted part that really, that was when I became a person was during the war, Derry was a very good place for a naval base because it was surrounded by hills that couldn't be bombed. So the American Navy wanted the base, this is going to be relevant, I'll tell you, um, to run its Battle of the Atlantic from. And they went up to the large Georgian, very inconvenient and grand houses in the McGee, Univ McGee College, um, which looked down over the foil where the ships were, was then a a dockyard for coal boats um, and they the person who was organizing it was told now take over one of those houses unless it's full of children well my parents had three children at that time um, and all under seven or seven and under I was the oldest but we had gone off to Donegal where my parents used to holiday Donegal on the west northwest coast of Ireland, an enchanted place, almost like as an enchanted as New Zealand. No, more so, more so. Um, and they had found a half-built cottage, and they bought it from an old dealer. And they got another mason to put a, a back, um, back room, as they called it, the back bedroom, onto it, so it would be big enough for them. And then there was an attic, you, climb, you climbed up some stairs up to it, wooden. St well, not stairs, no, no, a ladder. Um, well, we'd gone off there for the very, very first time for a fortnight over Easter. But my father then came back a little bit before because he was teaching at the university. So when he was asked um, if there's a house with children, he was so truthful. My mother, if she'd wanted to stay in Derry, would have said, yes, three. He said, no, 
and so they took the house over <laughs> and that was the greatest miracle for us really because that year well my father was hard for him he cycled down he took five hours and you know punctures and rainstorms and so on and impossible hills um, and arrived in the middle of the night on Friday, went back in the middle of the night on Sunday. But my mother with three small children, the youngest under one, no running water, of course, no toilet, um, no road. You had to clamber up on hands and knees. Um, no electricity, never. No shops, no neighbor. Well, yes, there were neighbors four fields away. Um, on either side, and down below, what was called a gentle wood. Now, a gentle means a fairy wood. That Yates, F A E R I E wood, going down to the. I keep using the word magical shore, <laughs> and I remember going down there and going off just to the right on my own, my little own self, and finding because it was Easter, the primroses and the violets and the white wood sorrel and I had never known anything like it I still remember that as a I wouldn't have used the word then a kind of heaven and I think that comes in all my books I maybe forgot no I never forgot it but it was a little bit more submerged during my academic writing so I still do that and it was just a, a magical inspirational place then yes and for my mother I mean how she coped <laughs> goodness knows, on her own, and with um, the little hunchback, um, um, not no, not cobbler, carpenter on one side, and the dealer down below on the other side of the hill, both of whom made approaches to her. She, I think she had to actually fight them off, though she never really told me about that, but my sister guessed, my <laughs> sister being a nurse guessed. Um, but she... For her, it was the most wonderful year ever. And it inspired her to write, didn't it? It did. Oh, you have done some research on it. <laughs> yes, she wrote a wonderful book, Agnes Finnegan, called um, Reaching for the Fruit, Growing Up in Ulster, which is wonderful. And it talks quite a lot about that year and about some of the other things, about what my father did, because he was a, he was a pacifist. Um, and he'd grown up in a very liberal family where they had to speak German at mealtimes or one mealtime a day anyway. And so he had helped, along with some people in the Rotary Club, to get a number of Jews out of Austria in the late 30s when they could see what was coming. Um, they didn't have a call up in Northern Ireland because they would never have managed it with the Catholics. It's not politically possible. But people knew he was a pacifist and he was really persecuted. Wow. And in a way, as a child, I was a little bit because of him once we moved back to Derry again. And, but I was so proud of him. Um, and he and my mother were both left wing in an undoctrinaire way. And at that time, you were either Catholic or Protestant. Never and between, wouldn't to you? get the political situation back then, the North was part of the UK and era yes. was as it is it was a republic as it is now so the situation exactly. was similar exactly. i see and the republic was neutral but the north was was part of the allies that's right um, actually era was quite helpful to to england mm -hmm. at the time though not officially yeah um because they would be a coastline that was friendly and um, your father being an academic was he under more pressure being a pacifist than if he was in, say, another line of work, or did it actually help? I don't know that it helped. I don't know if it made it worse, but it was hard for him because the McGee College then was, it hadn't been founded that way, but it had become a seminary for... And he was the um, president of McGee College at the time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. later. That was I 47, I think, yeah. Okay, yeah. Or 46. Um, it was, at that time, a seminary for the training... Presbyterian ministers, and he did that in a very liberal way and trained some very, very good ones. Um, but it, it meant the Catholics couldn't come, wouldn't come, and they felt that they, they, they were excluded, though actually he would have loved to have them. But the, he was very, very, un, this was the other reason, one of the three reasons he was so unpopular 
among the very powerful Unionist Presbyterians. Oh, so powerful. Um, because he opened it, he managed to organize an act of parliament to turn McGee into a university college, which is now is and very flourishing as part of the University of Ulster. Um, and he went to see the Catholic Bishop of Derry to organize that Catholics could come. I don't know that many did, but the principle was so important. And I do remember him coming back one day. Of course, my mother was totally supportive of all this. Um, um, when they were appointing a professor of philosophy, and he was on the appointing board, and some of the other people in the appointing board started trying to quiz this man about his Christian beliefs, and my father shut him up. And that made my father, of course, very unpopular, but God, do you think he was right? <laughs> so he was an academic of the, a statesman, really, of the true type. But also but was, a, a bit of a rebel on the quiet, too, then. Yes, in his gentle way. Yeah. Um, he and my mother um, got founded a non-sectarian Labour Party in Derry. You know, Catholics and Protestants both in it, and a union for the dock workers. And that was amazing because at that time they were working on the coal boats and they had no, no protective clothing. So they were always having awful injuries to their hands but then they got it. Um, and it wasn't that my parents ran the union. The union just somehow emerged when they were around. And I remember meeting some of them. They, oh, yes, they used to meet up in my parents' attic. <laughs> oh, the parent, the police didn't like that. The subversive. Wow. In the attic. <laughs> wow. So I was very proud. Very yes. proud of my father. And my mother... She was amazing. I think maybe in some way, my father influenced my academic work very much. He was a classicist as well. Yeah. But my mother, my kind of intuitive, imaginative writing. I remember when I wrote my first dissertation, she read it very politely and she liked it. Um, and she said, it's rather pompous academic language, Ruth, isn't it? <laughs> and I've remembered that ever since. So if anyone ever asks me, and I think you would say the same, as a speaker and narrator and actor, if anyone asks me, what is the one thing you would advise a writer? I would say, listen. Listen, listen with your ears, with your sonic soul. Because it shouldn't be like writing, it should be like inner speaking. And that's how literature began. And that's part of my academic work, of course. All the that, that's really interesting because, you know, I was a radio presenter. Well, I still present a couple of radio shows, but I was a, a radio presenter for a long, long time. And I was trained at the Australian Film and Television, te Australian Film, Television and Radio School. Uh -huh. And one of the first things they taught us was writing broadcast copy. And they said to us, you've got to think of broadcast copy because it's got to be read out loud. You've got to think of it as the storage of conversation. Uh -huh. Oh, beautiful story and, for conversation. And that was yeah. one of the first things they taught us at, at radio. Yeah. Uh, like yeah. within the first week was uh, was brought because they said if you can, yeah. if you can write copy that's that can be read out, and you know yeah. poetry is 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 a classic example of that. If you can you know write something that can be read out in a conversational style, yeah. that's that's the goal yeah. for broadcasting copy. Yeah. So and isn't yeah, it it's lovely interesting. That audio books have come back to that. Yes. They've come back to radio and they've come back to my idea about all the literature. And a very handy thing, and this is the sort of second but related thing I would say about writing, is I've now discovered that a very good way of doing it, and actually the software that just automatically will do it, I discovered by accident, um, is to speak what you want to say and then it transcribes itself or you can get it transcribed. And of course there'll be a few errors in it. Um, but then it comes out in the right sort of style. Yeah. And yeah. I've just been, you said you were wondering what I was working on now. I've just finished what's going to be an audio book called, well, it first of all came out as a rather written book, but too long, a bit too pompous, called The Hidden Ordinary, which is about how there are so many, this is a typical anthropology approach, there's so many things in life we just take for granted because they're so familiar, we don't notice them. 
um, and I can relate this, but not in a pompous way, to a lot of academic work. Like, we don't realize that we really only understand ourselves when we tell the story of ourselves. If someone says, who are you? Who are you, Graham? You probably start telling me the story of your life or the story of your vision or of where you wanted to go. And, and the whole thing is also talk about music and about how we don't necessarily think that poetry, what is poetry? And I quote a little bit of Somali song written by an illiterate Somali taxi driver that then became very popular in urban Somalia. Um, and if you put it down on a bit of paper, it doesn't look like anything, but it is poetry and why? And it's about the sound. And that all ties in with my thing on oral literature, which in a way was how I sort of made my mark to begin with. Or studying storytelling was the other thing that made my mark in West Africa, where we'll, we'll get them down. We'll we'll get yeah. onto all we'll get onto all of that bit in a bit West Africa oh. and Fiji and 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 all the places you went wow. but we we really didn't really get out of out of Ireland we were in we were in Derry uh, <laughs> briefly and we were also in, in Donegal where you you talked yeah. about your mother writing things about the um, the the fairy wood and yeah. a lot of that ended up in your work too with the uh, the yeah, semi autobiographical uh, Black Ink Pearl didn't it. That is really autobiographical in a metaphorical way, I hasten to say. I hasten to thought out who the actual people might be involved in the hero. Um, but then that, that Black Ink Pearl, I realised it's a kind of myth, you know. Girl rejects lover, re repents, tries to find him, which is also a parable of Christian life. Um, but all myths come out, they stay the same, but they're recycled in many, many different versions. So there are now many different versions told from different perspectives of that, the black inked pearl. Yeah, yeah. It and all came in dreams. What's that? It all came in dreams. I didn't say I'm now going to write a novel. Never occurred to me. I'm an academic. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, reasonably successful too. <laughs> yes. Uh, I do know that some anthropologists write novels, but that's a bit eccentric and odd, but that probably they had a funny kind of background. Though it makes sense if you study narrative that you try it out a bit. But then I just started having these... No, first of all, I wrote some short novellas, which came in dreams, just for fun. Then I talked to someone in America who was a, one of these kind of author coaches or something, and he said... Um, I sent him a little bit and he said, well, it's not a novel. A novel has to be 40,000 words. Oh, I said to myself, it is a novel. And that very night, so it was deliberate and not deliberate. That very night, I dreamt the first chapter. And then I, it was a chapter a night for 49, for seven weeks, 49 chapters. I think maybe it was slightly more because occasionally I would have to miss it. Never missed a night, but I wouldn't be able to write it up the next day. Yeah. For 49, I prefer 50. I like round numbers, so I'd better divide one of these chapters. But then I saw that the epilogue was there all the time. It was just very short. I hadn't noticed it. Um, and it was really so like my field work was recording storytelling. Yes. And yes. I would then transcribe it having done that it was just like that yeah when you transcribe you have, and you'll know this from radio work you have some discretion about you know the paragraphs and the punctuation and so on because it's not set in an oral form but you're not allowed to change the substance well it was just like that but then have i never forgot even if i couldn't do it for two three days but having transcribed it i then forgot it when i read the black ink pearl I do know the overall synopsis because um, I'm always having to tell people, but I couldn't tell you the titles of the chapters, let alone what sentence is going to come next. I wonder if that's because, you know, you've you've stored it in a written form and your brain goes, well, that's already stored there somewhere else. I don't need to keep hold of this just yeah, for efficiency. Yeah, I don't know. I spend a lot of time telling people don't um, upgrade writing and think it's the top thing, or even language, think it's the top, the cognitive bit of language. 
Um, but writing is very handy. Yes, for storage, yeah. yeah so 1945, storage. it's after the war now, your parents sent you away. They sent you away to a, a Quaker school in York. Why was that? Well, I think you can work that out for yourself, but I better tell you. Um, <laughs> If you grow up in the north of Ireland, even now, you know, you know that the world is divided essentially into two parts, one called Catholic, one called Protestant. Some people may try to call themselves atheists, but they have to be either a Catholic or a Protestant atheist. There's no choice. Culturally, yeah. And, and, and it depends on what school you go to, of course. Yeah. Not so much now, but pretty much still. And my parents didn't want me to grow up like that. They couldn't actually stop it. And of course, I had to go to a Presbyterian church school, the Londonderry High School, which is very good in lots of ways, but it still was the Presbyterian Londonderry High School. So they sent me to a Quaker school because the Quakers somehow transcend that divide. Yeah. And I was so lucky. You and know, they're pacifists as well, which will tie into yes. you, you, your father's. Yes. Um... My parents weren't Quakers, but... Um, they had a lot of Quaker connections. My aunt, my mother's sister, was a strange woman, but wonderful, um, was a very leading Quaker. And her sister had married a Quaker. And of course, my father had a lot of Quaker connections. So that worked out very well. And of course, a lot of people think of Quakers as rather sort of grey and not interested in the arts. But the actual teaching and the discipline was well below what I'd had at the Londonderry High School. Really? And even there, there was some drama. Um, but the the drama and the music, above all, um, at at the Mount, the Quaker School, was amazing and influenced me all my life. And, you know, um, both Mary Ewer, who became quite a well-known actress, but then died, and Judy Dench overlapped with me. I knew, knew Judy Dench quite well. She was a couple of years below me. And I saw her in her first public part. And I, of course, she is always wonderful, but I think she has never been better. As the naughty little pretending to be so sanctimonious <laughs> little angel in the York mystery plays. Wow. So you got to see, you got to see something very special that, that is I now did. shared with I the did. world. When it was, yeah. did you have an inkling that she would uh, go on to bigger and oh, better no. things? I mean, we knew she was a very good actress. And then the person who was teaching elocution, as it was called, you know, encouraged her to go in for acting mm. and a couple of others as well and used her connections because she'd been in acting herself. Um, but, well, I just didn't really know about that world. But it wasn't done Quakerly, mm -hmm. just when I thought about it. Mary was lovely. Just an ordinary person, but very beautiful. Even and... in school uniform. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, now this is a turning point in my life and actually links into Black Ink Pearl, though I think I won't go into details quite how. If you wanted to, well, the headmistress of the mind, the new headmistress, didn't really think girls should go to university. She would encourage them to do sensible things like nursing. But there were three of us who wanted to do classics. Me, and I was quite clever, so that was sort of allowed as an exception. And then the two others, friends, because, well, they could come along with me. And we had a very good but rather mouse-like teacher. And we did all reasonably well at A-level. Hard for a girl, because they don't, girls don't begin Greek a long time after boys. But we still did well at school certificate then. Um, in one year, which was pretty good, actually. But when we came back to do Oxford and Cambridge entrance, you did both at that time, which would have been um, a fifth year in the sixth, fifth term in the sixth, that is the September to December term. We arrived back and we were told, oh, your classic teacher has left. Huh? I don't know whether she'd really left or whether she was encouraged. <laughs> what? you're going across to the boys' school to have lessons there. So we had to cycle across five times. Why they didn't cycle, I don't know. Um, I suppose because the teacher had other obligations there as well. And he was an excellent teacher. I will never forget the moment we went in. We went up the stairs to his upstairs flat, and there were three 
boy sitting opposite us and the three girls of us sitting opposite to them. I suppose we did, we were aware there were boys because though we were at, this was a companion boys school, we used to see them at Quaker meeting. They were side in one side, we would find in the other side and we would look or not look at them opposite. And also I was a member, and this was wonderful, it influenced me all my life, of the joint choir. We used to sing back and so on. I don't think any member of that choir would have failed to have been a choral singer all their lives. He was the most amazing conductor. But anyway, I didn't know any individuals from the choir. And I hadn't thought of myself as a girl, you know. I didn't think, you know, if you go to a girl's school, you don't feel gendered. Okay. You're just a person. Um, we filed in. I sat in the middle. And I was then head girl of the mount. We were introduced to three opposites. And the middle one was the head reeve, the head boy. And we had wonderful lessons. And um, they all got in because it was easy for men. I was the only one got into Oxford and Cambridge because that was very hard for girls then. Um, the other two both went on to do university study. I was the only one did the classics at, at Oxford, which was oh, wonderful and amazing. Um, but, and that was uh, an amazing time as well in the world, 1952 to 1956. Because if you'd gone to Cambridge, you might have been a spy. <laughs> no, I wasn't a man. <laughs> of course, yes. Yeah. You see, and I, be, I realised I'd become a girl. And the reason I realised I'd become a girl was that head reeve sitting opposite to me. And the funny thing was that we never looked or spoke. We didn't want to outside what we needed to, you know, now it's your turn to translate. Um, but we now, all our lives, know that there's been some, maybe we were married or something in some previous life or, I don't know. We both happily married other people and both feel we're very lucky and didn't know each other at all for 30 or 40 years. And then had lunch together occasionally. Haven't seen it for 10 years, but we, we write to each other occasionally our thoughts about books. So he's my best critic, as he will say, no, that is awful. And I might or might not take his advice, but I know he's basically on my side, however damning he is. And he has interesting thoughts. He's a Quaker, of course. Nice one. Um, his family come from the Lake District. They've been Quakers there for, and sheep farmers, I think, for, for three or four hundred years. Well, wow. from whenever Fox started Quakerism in the Lake District. And he comes of farming stock, still keeps hens, but he, in fact, was the head teacher of various Quaker schools where he wanted to encourage the children who had learning difficulties. And then when he retired, he became a school counsellor. So he's done a lot of good in the world. Well, you went straight into that. teaching from Oxford as well, though, didn't you? Yes, but I didn't do, or nor did he, do um, a certificate in education. Because after four years doing classics, I thought, A, I couldn't bear to just settle down. In, I want to go out into the real world. And, you know, I had a loan from my school. There were loans then, too, which I wanted to pay back. They actually, I didn't realise, assumed that I wouldn't pay it, that they would just give it to me, but that never occurred to me. So I went to this really very snobby school. Um, but I learned a lot, and I realised that I liked teaching, but they had persuade, tried to persuade me to go and do research in Oxford when I'd finished, and a lot of my friends did. And I thought, what a self-indulgent, London-centred thing to do. I'm Irish. I go out into the world. It's time I made a contribution, like my parents. But I discovered I really wanted to know more about things. And that though Greek and Roman culture were just, why anyone would call it work reading all that literature? It was very, very hard work, long days. I don't know. Um, but I had this feeling that though I could spend many lives trying to find out more about that, this was part of my left wingness. There might be more cultures in the world than Greece and Rome. Also, with some of my friends, I'd been a member of the um, Movement for Colonial Freedom, and that also opened my mind a little bit. In fact, I, I was engaged to someone who was a member of that, though that then very amicably dissolved. So were they, were they anti-British Empire then? 
no, no, not really, not in the way you might think. Because we are talking, uh, we're talking about a time there when you know there was yeah, the height of the is. British Empire. Yeah. 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 Well, I suppose they were, but it wasn't that they thought it was wicked. They just thought it was time to move on and become independent. Right. I remember from Guyana, Cheddy Jagan coming and Burnham coming and speaking and really inspiring us because I was um, a member of chairman of the Labour Club, which was a pretty open-minded, just left-wing group, but big, thousand. I remember chairing a meeting when Bevan came, Nye, Bevan came to speak. Yeah. And in those days, we just took it for granted that women would do anything. I went to Somerville, and I cannot, this is, I know this is a little off the point, I cannot bear these women who moan away now about, oh, at Oxford we were so deprived and discriminated against. Well, my goodness, <laughs> one woman to seven men, and we ran all the clubs, and we did. We got better results than many of them did. <laughs> <laughs> so that your quest to go out into the world and to, although you know studying classics, as you said, it was it was Greek and Roman. You you chose to go to Africa. Yes. Well, I don't quite know why Africa. There's something kind of I don't know mythic about you know the opposite of us is Africa. I was a bit misled about that. Yeah. Um, I also read some fairly sort of nostalgic, maybe the sentimental stuff. Um, and I was in touch with a very interesting psychiatrist who knew something about Africa. And I didn't know how you studied Africa. But then I asked various people and they said, the way you do it is to do anthropology. And of course, Oxford was the place because I had contacts there and could I, get, I could get funding. Um, and I studied under a very well-known anthropologist called E.E. E. Evans Pritchard, strange and very inspiring man, um, who became my sponsor, very important in academic life. Um, and then it just, I went to do a postgraduate diploma. I just went to do it because I thought it'd be interesting to find out. And then I found I was just sort of <laughs> on a line that was going to lead me to do field work. <laughs> which I'd never planned, but, you know, it just all happened and was the next step. And that was amazing. There was another quite revolutionary turnaround in my life. I and this, th always... this was very early on. This was uh, 1960, 61, and then again, 63 to 64. Yeah. So we're starting to get into into the 1960s now where things are, are changing fast, particularly for women. Did you find that difficult? Being a, being a woman in Africa and, and you know, doing this field work where you'd have to go and you'd talk to people and record conversations and, and all the rest of it, was that tricky? Well, I knew we were never given methods courses the way you would now, but I did know from where you picked up things like that was in the pub over beer with your <laughs> professor, um, that if you were doing field work as a woman, you had an advantage because you would find out about women's things without being threatening. But because you were foreign, you were an honorary man. So you could find out about men's things as well. Right. Um, so I was a little bit pulled around by it because participant observation, you should take part. But I was not going to spend my time bending down, doing the weeding uh, and other things and carrying the water the way the women did. Yeah. But it was a, an advantage. It was also, oddly enough, an advantage having to learn the language from scratch. Wow. Because coming in as white, and the first half, things were changing colonially, the first half of my time in Sierra Leone, which is where I went to West Africa, in the north, beautiful, um, they were colonial. Halfway through, they became independent. Not that up in the north it made much difference. It was just an, an excuse for a dance, and masquerade, <laughs> and so on. Um, but still, I was introduced by the British, by the district commissioner, which was the last thing I had been told as an anthropologist you should do, but somehow I found I, I did. Um, so I could have been seen as a bit of a threat, but if I couldn't speak the Limba language as well as a two-year-old, really, what harm could I do them? So you were, you were literally going out there and, and recording their stories, like on a tape recorder? 
and then transcribing that that's what yeah. the that's so what the work involved basically i would basically i had to well it wasn't meant to meant to be like that um i had been given a grant by the colonial social science research council which became the later social science research council to study why the limber would want to move to the town which not many of them did actually and which really surprised all of us why would they want to do such a thing? Well, to do that, I had to do what you was called a basic ethnographic survey. What are the local politics? Where do they live? What about their kin kinship structure, economy, and so on? Stories and myths at that time were thought to be very marginal, not part of the real life of the power struggle, and so on. Um, but it was only in time that I began to record the stories. Well, no, fairly early on, because I had a cousin who'd been involved in the Gaelic-Scottish um, linguistic survey, and he showed me his tape recorder. So I took a, a tape recorder with me, a battery, portable, quite big. Uh, I think I was one of the... ...at that time to do so, and I used it. So I started recording stories, and that was as well as doing the general survey stuff, which meant observing and questioning, um, so that I was able to write up a, a good survey for the colonial office, which they published, so that was okay. Um, but having recorded was a wonderful way in, because I would play a bit of it to someone, and go around and listen, and then they want, would want to emulate it. Right, right. So that... And what I discovered was, not straight away or consciously, but you had to be there to know it, was that as a classical scholar, I assumed that I would record, transcribe, and then I would have the proper stuff, the text. I would translate that, I would do a commentary, I would bind it up and so on. Um, notes, linguistic notes probably. And I showed it to some of my friends when I got back to Oxford. Because some of these stories are immensely moving and deep, and I had been very moved by them, learned from them. And one smiled sympathetically, said, oh, Ruth, yes, it is charming. A most lovely, admirable tale, children. I thought, he said, but I said, but Homer, he said, Homer. Oh, <laughs> and then I realized that what I'd got written down in the text was only the, the skeleton at the top. What had mattered for the multimodal performance? And that was the discovery that's really set off being the foundation of my whole career because it led to my understanding, but it also kind of set me in. They were just beginning at that point something called performance studies in America. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know about it, but I discovered that I was one of them. And they really liked me. Do you know why? Why? Because I was a pretty young girl and I would come but I wasn't going to be a competitor because <laughs> I lived in, I belong to a British university. It's still the same. I mean, not the pretty young girl. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't know. And uh, and that work is archived, isn't it, in the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, and it, it it's digitized even, so it, it's there forever. Yes, it is. So it is. Um, and and there is a a very good website called I think it's Oral Literatures of the World run by Cambridge and Yale. Right. Uh, not only that, but many, many others are, are gathered together. Well, it's amazing because I brought back these tapes and I hadn't annotated them properly, so I don't know which tied in with which translation. And they were just kept in an old shopping bag for about 30 years. And then I think it maybe was through open book publishers, open access. I was publishing my thing about oral literature in Africa, or re republishing it with pictures for the first time, which made so much difference. Because um, you can say, like anything, these storytellers or poets are individuals and they're creative. But to see one makes all the difference. Yeah. Um, and they said, did I have any recordings? So I said, oh, well, yeah, but it's just... Because the, um, I couldn't play them on any of our tape recorders. Because, you know, IT goes out of date. It's not as good as writing that way. <laughs> But I, I threw them over to them. They digitized them. They read them all. Wow. Even a bit of music, which pleases me. 
though I can never find it again. <laughs> and then you so get... I you, you so much to live back. And then uh, in 63, you marry David John Murray, the grandson of Sir James Murray, the first editor of the Oxford English Dictionary. Yes, and we have the whole... You know, it came out a little fascally to begin with and then was bound up and we had all the fascally um, given to us by one of Sir James's, sorry, Dictionary Murray's daughters. Yeah. Who was very fond of David, his aunt. Um, but of course, and, and they were annotated with little additions by Sir James himself. And they were the ones they used wow. in the scriptorium in Oxford. Yeah. Um, but we thought, they were very difficult to use, and, and no use just storing them and not using them. So we got the Oxford University Press to bind them up, which they didn't do very well, and they actually cut off some of the annotations. I can't believe it. But anyway, now they're, there they are, about, I don't know, 24 volumes in our sitting room. Nice one. And then you go off to Rhodesia. Yes. Now, the thing is, I was David and I got engaged in, I think, February 63. Three. So where did he you went, meet David? Ah, in Oxford, in Nuffield College, where we both had studentships. Right. And he had been to Uganda to teach, and I'd been to West Africa. He had missionary parents. I had missionary great-uncles. We had very much the same sort of ethics, except he was better off than me financially which I don't hold against him. I did a little bit to begin with. Oh, that was, um, that, was that the lefty side of you coming out? Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and he, um, he took a job then in southern Rhodesia, which as then was, which would be a little bit like the job in Uganda. And he was very interested in constitutions and politics. And at that time, everyone thought that the, the next um, election in southern Rhodesia would re result in one that would be going for independence. Right. But then they came out the other way round. But he still had to go. Um, and I was left to finish my thesis. And I finished it in rapid time. How everybody now will say four years. I had three years, including the field work and learning a language and writing an extra book. But I finished it because he was coming back. We were getting married in September in Oxford. Um, so we went out together. And at first we thought we could help students to fight this awful apartheid-like regime. Um, but really, in the end, we decided just being there as white people, we were doing more harm than good. It's a hard decision. I don't know if it's right or not. But we went to Nigeria, and that's where all three of our children were born. Wow. Uh, well, one was born in England, but went out there when she was six weeks, and I was pregnant. And I, pregnant I, I recommend, if you're going to be pregnant ever, Graham, do it in Nigeria, because every second woman is. <laughs> it's just like a factory belt giving birth, you know, it just happens, and then, then you go home. Um, and it's lovely to think that my children were born in, two were born in Nigeria. Yeah, windswept and interesting. Um, but it, it was while we were in Southern Rhodesia. Yeah, while we were in Southern Rhodesia, we... We, we spent two months back in Sierra Leone and people laughed like anything. Oh, you've got a husband. But it's useful because he could then take on photographs of me with them. Yes. Of course, I couldn't really take, didn't know how to take photographs of myself. And then when you came back, you were recruited as the founding members of an organization that must have changed so many people's lives in such yeah. a significant way yeah. you were founding members of the academic staff of the open university now people will be watching this all over the world can you just explain to anyone who doesn't understand what the universe the open university is it was a revolution in british higher education because at that time a very small proportion of 18 year olds went to university and university meant full-time, on-campus, lectures, tutorials, three years, ending up with a big bang exam. You would have to, it would be full-time, you'd have to totally give up everything to do it, which was very nice. 
Yes, for, for young people with no commitments, but for people who've exactly. maybe got mortgages and children and things, yeah. they might think that their time has, uh, they've missed the boat, they've, they're, exactly. their time of that has gone, yes. And that's what we need to go on to think about. There were correspondence courses, and you could tell from that there was a real demand. Yeah. But they were pretty low level, and they were looked down on. You wouldn't get a degree that way. But then various people, George Catlin, Jenny Lee, Harold Wilson, thought in their left-wing way where everybody counts, everyone has a right to it, not just health, but education. Um, why is it impossible for 50% or more of people, and not just 18-year-olds, to get education, and not leaving their homes, and not full-time, and not on campus, they could live anywhere. And why would they not get credit for every essay that they wrote? And why would they not get proper feedback? Because you know, at the time, at universities, if you wrote an essay and gave it in to your tutor, you might get a wonderful comment that said good, or another one that said poor, try harder. But you wouldn't know what was good about it or what was bad about it. Yeah. But we were trained as tutors and as teachers to begin with what was good. I mean, you've, you've had to go at it. Um, you found it confusing, but it is confusing. Well done. And then go on. And you could have made it even better by. And maybe you got a low mark, but you still have got somewhere. And that counted for 50% of your assessment. And you could do it all from home and much cheaper. Um, though you didn't get a grant the way the others did. That did sort of change a little bit. And there were lectures on TV early in the morning and late at night. I know. The BBC was very good. Uh, but here was one of the changes. We assumed that t teaching distance students, we would give lectures in the usual way and somebody like you would televise us or listen to us, record us, audio. And it would be just all the same. But there were two big changes we had to accept. The first was the biggest, which was that, well, when I used to lecture in Ibadan, in Nigeria, for example, I would think, oh, I put in a good performance and the students all wrote it down. And, oh, I, you know, when you've done a performance, you go home. You would know that maybe as an actor. You feel great, adrenaline. But what you needed to think about if you had stu distant students and you didn't see them, and you should have thought about it anyway, is that it's learning that matters, not teaching. And we had a few people from America and Australia who helped us begin to understand that. And from the army, um, they're very good that what students got out of it was what mattered. Not didn't matter in the least what you put into it. <laughs> it was what they got out of. And the other thing was that what really, I read a very good book saying, what's the use of lectures? And certainly you can be inspired by somebody charismatic. Um, but most of the lectures are just information. And you yeah. can get that more effectively and look it up more effectively in books. So the written word. So that's what we produce, but nicely formatted with pictures. And say in science, the wonderful science home experimental kits you could put up in your kitchen and do really good, important experiments yourself. But for television, why just stand up and talk about an experiment? Why not take students, which normal student normal students couldn't do, into some of the one of the great laboratories of the world, and let them look at the experiment there? And they would have a first-hand view. They wouldn't have to be jostling around to see it happen. So that's what happened, and it changed higher education. Um, first of all, it changed the way of teaching and assessing. Um, much more sympathy to students and more interest in learning and they're gradually more converts. To begin with, we were very much not only looked down on, but in a way feared, which is why to begin with, we would only take 21 year olds and, and older, up to 100 or 120 or whatever. Um, and we also ran summer school, so they would have a bit of experience of on-campus learning. Yeah. That worked well for the university, so they began to come round to us. 
because we used their plant in the oh so that you weren't you weren't as threatening to the status quo when when they were involved yeah no not so obviously threatening but they have they then gradually began to copy us by having continuous assessment which is another very very common thing and now more and more first of all the ex polytechnics who are always more go ahead and now many of the other universities would put, be putting on part-time um, distance education courses. So the open university, which still flourishes and doing particularly well during COVID, of course, where mm. people are definitely working from home, and the open university knows how to do online, learn, online learning in the way other universities had to scramble around to learn. It's now doing very well, though it's had its ups and downs financially. Mm. It's got a very excellent um, vice chancellor just now. And at the so, very beginning of it all, was yes, there a feeling of we're, we're taking a punt here? This might not even work. Or well, did you have the confidence that this is the future? People told us it wouldn't, wouldn't work, mm -hmm. but we had the confidence. And we learned so much about learning and teaching. And David, my husband, who's very good on administration and so on, his technical discipline is politics, but he prefers to call it government, the administrative side rather than the party political side. He did a great deal in helping to build up the whole structure and constitution. And ultimately, to begin with, we got a direct grant because we went to proper university. But he organised so that we would get something from the Department of Education and Science and be just one of the universities, as it is now. So I'm very proud of him and very proud of being Having they, I then spent all the rest of my career at the Open University, though we did have leave of absence in Fiji for three years. And I'm now an emeritus professor, so I will never not be a member. <laughs> Let's talk yeah. about uh, the South Pacific then. You, you were mentioning uh, earlier, before we started recording, about a, a story you're working on about a storm. Was that, was that the experience in the South Pacific and Fiji when you were involved in that? In the South Pacific, but not in Fiji, mm -hmm. um, we went to the University of the South Pacific partly by accident, not completely, with our three children. People said, oh, they'll drop out of education. Actually, they got a better education there and came back ahead of their peers. <laughs> um, and the point about the University of the South Pacific was that it was founded for all the British, all the English-speaking islands of the South Pacific. Yeah. Some of whom had very small populations yeah. and couldn't therefore afford to send people three whole full-time years. So the University of the South Pacific was beginning up a distance teaching, distance learning program. So right. they were very keen to have us. Yes. And we used to go off to the, the islands and start off a course and then they would have a local tutor. Well, the storm I was thinking about was actually not on the way to one of their, them, because that was why we went by um, aeroplane, which was wonderful, very expensive, and we didn't have to pay. Which was a little aeroplane, so it would be low down, you could see over the lagoons and change the colour of the seas. Really, that was magical as well. But one long vacation, we decided to go on um, a, a ship, a trade ship that... Um, carried goods around some of the islands and took just six passengers. Oh, that was <laughs> pretty amazing. Wonderful time. Because um, you would feel very close in. Now, a lot of these islands are lagoon islands, which means that um, they are enclosed by reefs. And a ship would go in through a narrow passage in the reef, reach the calm um, green water of the lagoon inside, and then land their goods on the beautiful palm tree fringed beach. Well, we were on this, it was called the Senpak Rounder, Central Pacific Rounder. We got in, there was only about an inch either side of the, the reefs are really jagged. And most vessels, including this one eventually, end up wrecked on a reef in the South Pacific. Well, we got into the lagoon. Oh, it's beautiful. We're going to go in in the little lighter, that is, the small boat, and we'll be welcomed with feasts and dances and the prayer. We'll have to make a prayer, but that was all right because my husband had a missionary father. 
um, when the captain said, if I had known, I wouldn't have come in. What? He said, there is a hurricane warning and it's just about upon us. So we all thought, oh, thank goodness, we're safe, we're near land. Yes, safe harbour. Yeah, but it's not no. a harbour. No, Graham. If I had known, I would have stayed out at sea. That's the only safe place. Look at the shore. And we looked, we hadn't noticed. It was littered with large and small wrecked vessels all along the shoreline. Because if there is a hurricane and a reef no barrier to it coming, sweeping across, you are swept by the wind onto the shore and wrecked. And that's where well, the damage nothing. occurs. But if you're out at sea, there's nothing to hit. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, you might be very rough. And sick. Yeah. Um, so, do you know, but he couldn't go out again because the wind was blowing violently in towards. And anyway, it would have been too dangerous to go through the reef. So he dropped both anchors, anchors at both ends, I think, of the ship. He kept the engine going full steam astern for four days. And we just stayed in the same place. And have you ever, Graham, seen rain fall horizontally? No. I, I lived in New Zealand for a while and we got some oh, we got some trop yeah. in the north of New Zealand actually cyclones, in Northland. Yeah. We get this we get oh, the tropical wow. cyclones come through. There was one in particular called Cyclone Bowler, I remember, not long after Julie and I had bought a house and the house was a wooden house. And I was like, oh. you can't build houses out of wood when there's a cycle. But we we, yeah. we weathered the storm, battered down the hatches and weathered the storm. That's the closest I got. But I've never actually, it was it was pitch black. It was at night when it really yeah. got up. But I've not actually seen rain horizontal, no. I've been through some big storms in New Zealand, but not horizontal, no. Yeah. My daughter lives in Auckland, looking mm -hmm. out over the Hauraki Bay, and I visit her often. But yeah. have been in a cyclone there? Oh, I lived in I lived rain. in Northland. I lived in Whangarei, which you might know. Whangarei is about two and a half hours drive from Northland before you get to the Bay of Islands. Yeah. And and I married Julie's a Kiwi, oh, and we we beautiful. got married in in Paihia at a little stone church on the waterfront in Paihia well, in the I Bay of Islands. That church would be like. Um, no, she lives in um, Glendowie. Looks out over the Gulf. Yeah, over Hauraki um, Gulf. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and New Zealand is not quite as magical as Ireland, but it's where I first started writing the Black Ink Pearl. Really? And I always, when I say dreams, I'll go back to the storm in a minute. When I say dreams, I should more accurately say that liminal in between space that anthropologists and psychologists talk about, which is neither asleep nor awake, but both, where you yeah. reach into your unconscious. Um, and New Zealand is, for me, a liminal space, because it's both up, over, and down, under, night and day, home, not home. <laughs> um, also, land of ancient wisdom and of modern technology. Yes. Um, so it's, and, and I was both by the sea and in the sea, but not. And myself and not myself. Anyway, going back to the hurricane, it really, really was a hurricane. Yeah. Not only did the rain fall horizontally, but the sea was dead flat. Really? You'd think it would have been great waves. You would think so, yeah. The wind was blowing all the tops off the waves. Of course. Right, so yes. it just flattened it out. So wow. after, after... I think it was going up and down, but very slowly. After four days, we did manage to land, but it was quite a business getting into the boats. <laughs> and we did have a feast and, and prayers and so on. Um, but that was quite an experience. I've been in some other storms, but the, that's the only one I really want to talk about. So that's but the... The storm, comes, the storm comes into the screenplay I hope you're going to find me a producer one day, Graham. Screenplay that I've written from Black, the Black Ink Pearl, which won lots of prizes, in which the two, it's about the earlier life of the two who are the um, heroes and heroes of Black Ink Pearl. That myth just grows and grows with me. Well, you mentioned, you mentioned an earlier really life. Good. You mentioned an earlier life. And... 
something more recently then you you found yourself getting interested getting interested in is is spiritual and, and paranormal experiences and, and altered consciousnesses what or altered, altered consciousness what 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 is that yeah, all about is, then uh, well as an anthropologist i have read about or studied a lot of society australian aboriginal societies some of them some african indian who feel that, who believe, who feel, I think is the right word, who know that this earthly, ordinary surface physical life isn't everything. Maybe it's not the true reality, it's only just one reality. And I'm, anthropologists often go and look at somewhere abroad to see the characteristics, the deep features of something, which may be around them, I haven't noticed because it's too familiar, like the book. them think about them uh, of knowledge and now the alternative or heightened consciousness as it's often called which is a quick way of summing up dreaming in contact with the dead hang on a second ruth you've frozen there your, your picture and your sound have frozen so if you can, oh no, you. I think you're back now. If you can just back up a little bit, you're talking now. about uh, so uh, I've dreaming. been writing about that, for example, in the International Encyclopedia of Anthropology, and there are a number of anthropologists and innovative scientists as well who are extremely interested in this and have written. Usually, when they retire, they've written about it because while they're actually in their job, people say, "Oh, he's independent. He's gone gaga." But once they retire, they can kind of come out of hiding. Okay. So that's one reason. <laughs> the other reason is what's led me into creative writing. I think I said I would never have dreamed I would have got into anything like that. I'm an academic. I would like to be a professor, though, I, as a woman. You asked about being a woman. I never really wanted to push. But in the end, it, it all came, and I got various honours. Um but about 10 years ago, maybe there's something in the physical after all, I was taken to hospital as the, my husband, my medical vet daughter, said I needed to go to hospital 999 because I'd become very odd and wasn't acting like myself. I don't quite know why. When I got there, well, the, the local, the, the um, ward, the ward, doctor who was fairly junior thought it might be some mini strokes because for a while I couldn't speak my nearest and dearest and I would kind of shake I couldn't finish my it was only for two or three minutes each time but once we got on to something fairly neutral I could do it again but there was also a very leading consultant who'd worked a lot on something called wait for it autoimmune encephalitis and he reckoned that's what I had now, that means literally, if you know your Greek, the swelling of the brain. And autoimmune means that you cure it yourself. So you never quite know when you're cured and you never relapse. They've been hoping so much I would relapse. It would make medical history and make their names. But I have. Um, well, what happened was they did some sonic investigation. I don't know why sonic. And they discovered that some of the language wires, brain waves or something, the left side of my brain had been destroyed. But the brain is so wonderful. They cure themselves, but they grew again. They didn't cure themselves. They grew again in new directions. Right. Directions which meant writing novels and screenplays and poetry and um, libretti and children's books telling stories, becoming more aware of the sonic. And it also meant that the, the right side of my brain had to do more work for a while. Now, there used to be a lot of nonsense about left and right brains, but they've yeah. been much more imaginative and um, subtle, well-founded work recently. And it does look as if the left brain is in charge mainly of the kind of positivist, scientific, logical side. Yeah. And I was good at that. Yeah. yeah, I'm actually. 
Yeah. Um, whereas the right brain is in charge of the pictorial, the imaginative, the poetic music. And the but, emotional. And yeah. this is where modern thinking has taken us. The two have to work together and language in a way seeps across from one to the other. And I think it was that, whatever you want to call it as a diagnosis, the start of me off being in this way. I still do both. And it also means that you'll be shocked by this. And if I wasn't talking to you, I might be asleep. Um, I tend to need to sleep 12 to 14 hours a day in two goes. So every afternoon, I'm not necessarily asleep, but in bed for maybe two or three hours. Yeah. Uh, and that's when I'm most creative. And the consultant that I went to see, who signed me off a long time ago, said, would I like him to recommend something because I he, you could regard that as a sleep disorder and I thought seriously about it because it might have been good for my husband to know he was there and I said no because it seems that this is the natural thing for my body for me first second this is when I am most creative I don't yeah. find how or why but it is and I'm much more productive now that I a four hours a day, much more than I ever was. And third, I enjoy it. <laughs> I think it's a natural thing of nature being amazing, but we're not always aware of it. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure about paranormal, because that sounds, para sometimes suggests not quite proper. Yeah. But if it means going along parallel with something, then it's a good term. Okay. Okay. Well, I prefer to think of it as just a, an alternative but equally viable, valid uh, form of reality. Okay. Yeah. Which you must know about. I... You know, I... Well, let me say, when I read, say in church, but not just in church, I may read something beforehand which is pretty boring, nothing in it. But when I stand up and I read it, especially if, especially if, there's somebody, if there are people there, helping to create it it starts to glow and it's like that for always now where does that come from what is that well it's whatever that is that i think is is i'm now a little bit more in touch with and you must know about it i i do i do get a feeling when i well particularly when i read your work there is something in it that when i speak it out loud there is the only way I can describe it is I used to be in a band and sometimes ah. when you when you rehearse with a band and there may be like only four of you but when it goes really well it's like there's an extra person in the room when you do a tune particularly well it's like there's something else extra here and I get that same feeling when I read your work is that I do it and it's like, no, there's something else here. I don't know what it is or where it's coming from. And it and it just brings more to it. And I don't know what that is. That's the only way I can describe it. Because I'm not particularly spiritual. But there is, it just feels like there's an extra thing there, whatever it is. Yeah. What a lovely thing to have said. It also reminds me of these stories, which I believe of people who have maybe there's two of them who have taken an impossible journey across the Antarctic or something and are convinced that there's been a third person with them the whole time. And in a way, how could we say they're wrong? Yeah. But I hadn't heard, heard about it of the band before, and that is wonderful. I remember that. Don't be surprised if it comes into one of my novels or poems. Or yeah, something. yeah. If, if there's a four-piece band and you do a you do a number and it goes particularly, it's like there's an extra some extra musician in the room, just giving it something extra. And it's the, I think That's it's wonderful. The, yeah, and, and I definitely get that when I do your stuff. Maybe it's you that comes through. Well, it's me being in the vehicle of something. I think. <laughs> I don't know. That leads us nicely into the audiobooks, which we should talk about before we lose the connection, because we've had some ups and downs with the <laughs> Internet today. Yeah. So the first audio book you and I did together was Grass, Miracle from the Earth, which you didn't actually write, really, did you? Oh, I, I didn't. Every word there was put in on my iPad by me. 
Um, but it was written in spare, indirectly, not word for word, by my mother's father, who had a very hard life, I can tell you about in a minute. So it was written in his memory and in his honour. And his name was actually David Campbell, um, may have been Calendar Campbell. And Calendar is my great grandmother's maiden name. And so when my mother founded a press together with me um, to write, to publish her book that you've read, Reaching for the Fruit, she said, I said, what will we call it? She said, Calendar Press. And when I say calendar, it's C-A-L-L-E-N-D-E-R. It's a Scottish name. Um, and he had a hard life because he lived in Derry. No, his family had been very well off way back, you know, the kind of Lords of the Manor. But they gradually, not badly, come down a bit in the world. And the family then ran... Uh, I think it's a corn importing business, which wasn't doing very well because things were changing. Now, his brothers managed to get out of it and his sisters and go off to be missionaries, leaving their children, once they were seven, to be <laughs> looked after by the maiden aunt. Well, that was what happened then um, in Derry. Um, he longed to do that. He, he was very spiritual, had the mind about economics. He wasn't a bit good at running a business. But he, somebody had to do it. Don't know that he was the oldest or anything. He just was the one that was somehow left with it. He was soft and gentle. So they went bankrupt. They had no money, which meant that they grew up. And that's why my mother was always so healthy, I think, at Wari, on the proceeds of their little garden, living in a rather poor little house in Derry. He had a bad time because, and this is very tragic, um, at that time, there was a kind of terrorist police force called the Black and Tans after their uniform in Northern Ireland. Um, and they ran into him. He was walking at the corner of Asylum Road in the Strand down near the docks with their motor bicycles and injured him dreadfully. And they, he was carried up to the hospital. And my mother, the youngest, was the only one at home because her brother was at sea as a, an engineer his sister was married, or about to marry. Her other older sister was in Belfast. And he was made to sign a thing saying it was his fault. And I said to my mother when she told me, couldn't you have done anything? And she just looked at me. How could I have asked such a thing? I was 17, she said. Well, he lingered on a few years. And I suppose he felt he was a burden, but of course he wasn't. And... He loved the garden. One day my mother went out and there he was hanging in the garden shed. Goodness me. She went in and got the carving knife and cut him down. I, I only really know all the details of that from my sister quite recently, my younger sister, who lived with my, looked after my mother when she was dying wonderfully. But he has always inspired me and he founded the first museum in Derry. I don't know what was in it really. I remember a big lump of rock and a stuffed crocodile. But he also was quite a researcher and he traced the the flights of birds. So I know he was a naturalist. And the next book I'm going to do in his name, maybe you'll be reading it for me, is about birds. Mm -hmm. um, and what I like about the book about grass and the one about the moon, which I don't think you did read. Not yet, um, no. No, no. Um, they they begin with a bit about the evolution of the science. So I've made the science a bit less in the um, in the other ones. I mean, you get got over it very well, and it, it worked well in writing, but not mm -hmm. so well in audio yeah. and learning. Yeah, um, I'm publishing them all in both written and audio form, um, and of course, in the written form, you have the advantage you can have a lot of pictures, but in all of them, there's a bit of science, but then quite a lot of like folklore and proverbs and the wisdom that we get and the art um, from grass, from birds, from the moon. So after birds, it may be donkeys, the wisdom of the humblest, but we'll see because they all have a lot of mythology associated with them. So I love that series and they're all going to be with written and with pictures and audio.
So you did write them, but they're based on I his did. work. But you've credited it as him as the writer, though. Yeah, I'm not, I haven't. I think in the recent one, I do say it is me in his honor. Yeah. But I, I'm not wanting to conceal it. I just want him to have the honor. And it's actually, that's the one that's been selling best. Well, I've been only five, but still. But it's only been out a short time yeah. among the audio books. Yeah. And it's I mean, it, it's expensive in printed form because of all the picture car. Um, but it's still been selling reasonably well. And it has some absolutely stunning reviews if you look on Amazon. Great. Great. I'm proud. I'm proud of it. I'm proud of it. But I feel I owe so much to my, especially my maternal family. I mean, I appreciate my, my father's family too, the physical science there, but um, my maternal family. And when my father married, his family, apart from his mother and one sister, rather turned against him and thought it was all my mother pulling him into this awful lot left-wing stuff. They were very liberal, but left-wing was not, and pacifist. So, I think I, I think it was the, the student Christian movement that he met at university and his own thinking. And, oh, the Greeks were, there was some wonderful, what I would call pacifist writing among the Greeks. You wouldn't believe it. Um, and Erasmus, who was his great hero, who wrote the first pacifist book, really, um, that I've also published um, a translation of, um, translated by somebody else. Um, so they rather turned against him and thought it was my mother who'd made him this way. Um, but certainly they cooperated very, very much. So when I say I'm very influenced by my maternal family, my father is part of that. Um, so the calendars and the name Kate, oddly enough, there's some, I don't know if everywhere the name Kate has a special magic about it. Whenever I've mentioned this in a lecture, Always somebody has come up saying, yes, my daughter, Katie, for example, knows what I want to eat when she's down to the bottom of the garden it's the first time I wanted it. <laughs> um, but the very first person in that reaching for the fruit book, the, the girl who was left pregnant when mm -hmm. um, the, um, the then Sinn Féin person fled to Canada, um, was called Catherine. And all the way down, and I don't know whether it's on purpose or it just somehow happened, they've been... Catherine's and Catherine's and Katie's and so on. And my granddaughter in New Zealand, my daughter not having thought at all about family background, was called Kate. <laughs> but she didn't tell me beforehand that she was going to be called Kate. She said she was going to wait to see if she was a Kate. So within two minutes of the birth, she phoned, she says, yes, she is Kate. <laughs> Lovely. So that was the grass one. Then the next one we did together, and I know these are not in the, the right order, but these are the order that, that I know them in. The I order to, they came to I me. happened to find you. Yeah. Yes. Was Heaven's Rocker. Oh, which, yes, yes. which was which was now, very different. It was a wild ride. Well, I think I said that um when I well, going back in chronology. When my brain began to change, I first of all wrote some short novellas, though I linked them together into a longer book. Um, and I thought there was nothing to them. I did publish them because I wanted to... I like learning things, experimenting. But what, I knew I wouldn't make any money. I mean, I still don't, but after all, what's money for? Um, I thought I was saving money for my old age that, to pay for me in a nursing home. Now I realize it's to save me from having to go into a nursing home and keep me happy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I published these, and it was called um, originally The Heavenly Rocker, I think. Right. And it was like one sort of section in that book. And now I've gone back to them, and I've discovered they're really quite interesting. Yeah. Um, so there's that one, and then the universe gets destroyed, if you remember, at the end. Yeah. But it's followed by The, the Lady and the Dragon, the Dragon's Tale, in which a dragon, very depressed, you wouldn't make dragons with a prayer. Oh, everything he was so ugly. He finally manages to help to create his universe that he thought he had destroyed. And the girl from Donegal loves him. And he looks at his ugly bumps about three quarters of the story. And it's now in audio, but I haven't found you, I think, because it was the first one. So I think it's just waiting to go into audio because I recorded it myself first. Yes. And got a fiver to turn to um 
fix the the um the files that could go into ACX. Yes, to the to the standards. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't download and everything went wrong. So I've now got somebody else to read it, and it should be there fairly soon. And in the end, the little girl looks at the dragon lovingly, and he looks at himself. And he's not ugly. All those wonderful curves and creamy scales. He's, he's unique. He's beautiful. Yeah. But then the, it, it, it's, I'm now going to gradually publish it as audiobooks, but it has to be Kindle or something first before you're allowed to do it as an audiobook. Oh, I see. It has to be in the in the Amazon universe, yeah. probably. Um, yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. But that's all right. I don't mind. Um, I'm calling it the Little Angel series to come the Kate Pearl series. Now, the Kate Pearl series is the serious one. Yeah, because Heaven's Rocker is a lot of fun, and and what I like about Heaven's Rocker, it's about it's about a, a a drummer, a rocker, and she comes down from heaven and stuff. And because there's that rhythm of the rock, there's a rhythm in the well. For me, there was a rhythm in the yeah. in in the writing, and I just love that the way it rock. It actually rocks. Yeah, uh, I love the way you did it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's lovely but, to find someone who can do it like that. And I then we get to lost together. Then, then the next one was was Pearl of the Pearl of the Wind. We did next. Yes. Now that was a funny one because I had written the Black Ink Pearl and then the prequel because I wanted to do a series for young adults, which is similar style but a little, little bit simpler, and also about the younger, the teenage times of the the hero and heroine of the Black Ink Pearl. And then I thought it would be rather interesting to do one from the perspective of the sea, very Homer, the the um, wine dark garrulous sea. That's a direct translation from Homer. It's a much laughing, polygalast sea. Um, but at the same, as I said, the same myth, but a different way of doing it. A girl who was afraid of swimming in the sea, and one which made me much more sympathetic to the hero. The mm -hmm. hero is pretty bad, pretty horrible in a way, mm. in the Black Ink Pearl. But here you saw that she was the one who actually let him down. Yes. Um, now, Pearl of the Wind, I never thought I would write another one, but actually now there are two or three coming partway there. Um, I've got too many things happening, Graham. <laughs> well, I'm so lucky. Sometimes I wake in the middle of the night and I think, oh, I've got so much to do. I must, I must really worry. Because you've got to panic, you've got too many things to do. Or I'll wake up in the morning and I'll have to make a priority list and so on. And then even in the night I can feel creeping up from my gut a smile. I'm so lucky, all these wonderful things in the world to do. Anyway, I was on a cruise and I read this thing, actually I misunderstood the timing, um, in which there was a competition to write a novel, a whole novel, in three days, flat. Right. And somebody had to certify and done it. I thought, well, that's a rather interesting idea. And I actually misunderstood the um, starting date, so I don't think it counted. Right. Um, but I did do one in three days, and that was it. And again, I just dreamt a bit, and it, it came. It's the same story, but this time it's the wind. Yeah, well, you, the the so, wind one, you you feel you feel the wind the, the wind move through it, and the pearl of the sea, you feel the sea move through the story yeah. as well it, yeah 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 it's you really uh, feel it it's lovely you glimpse it you do you do it it's there mm -hmm. so how did you get on to audiobooks how long ago then did you discover that that was a a, a way to go well, that was mid mid may okay um how did i it may I think perhaps it was because I mean, they've been around for a while and people have talked about them being important and so on and growing mm. and not so much competition and so on. But I was invited, well, I sort of invited myself and then they commissioned me because they hadn't thought of doing it amazingly. Again, the International Encyclopedia of Anthropology that I'd already written for, um, I suggest they really needed a piece about publishing, but that communication that goes the way back and in different forms, including orally, Mm -hmm. Why should you publish orally, except for just more face to face? Um, it needs to be studied and looked at in contact text. And I've now written it, sent it in, but it's too long and I've got to change it a bit, but I'm doing that. 
But in doing that, I had to look around very hard. I thought I knew it all, but actually it meant a lot of research. And I came more and more onto audio books. And I thought, look, I've tried all these other things, self-publishing and picture books and oral and, well, talking about oral literature, but how about doing it? So then I tried out. And the I think it was the, the dragon was the first one I did, though it actually it wasn't the first one that appeared. Mm -hmm. So now having I've, having discovered it, it's just such fun. It is. And though I don't though I don't do things to earn money, I think I will probably get more money per effort from there. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Well, because the books are written already, and it's yes. just a matter of sometimes I pay somebody to read them. Sometimes I do this split royalties business. Yes. Yeah. Where you don't have to pay anything. Yeah. I can't imagine why a narrator would want to do that, but. Maybe they guess it's good to sell. I don't know. It's it's um, I've well from from my point of view, some of them I I do for uh, a split royalty. I did. I've got um, and and some of them I most of them now I do for 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 pay for finished out pay for production. Yeah. But there is there is one I I did. It was it's called the Goblin Summoner, and it's by a Welsh <laughs> author, yeah. and yeah. it went on sale. I think it was like week and a half ago it's already sold a thousand copies and you know Why you get we do that for us? <laughs> well do that? we we could do that but you know considering with the percentage of it i get like four quid per copy i was glad i did that one as a royalty share yeah. um yes. th that yeah. one's come out good but usually they don't work out that way i've done a lot of royalty yeah. share books that haven't sold very many and and yeah. i've done a lot with a um, finished hour that have sold a lot, but I've missed out because I wasn't, I was, I got paid up yeah. front, you know, so yeah. it's just a gamble. I always say to Julie, I say, it doesn't matter which way I take it. I'm always going to get the worst deal, <laughs> but that doesn't matter. You know, it, when it all comes down, it's, it's better than working. And the difference for me with the audio books and with radio, which is what I previously did is radio goes out there and it disappears. There is an archive of it somewhere, but nobody really can find it. Radio goes out and it disappears. But the audio books, they're going to be around forever. So I better do this right. And I better do this right by the author because it's their work and it's their, their life and there's so much of their life it comes out yeah. in their work i've got to get this right because and and it, you know if i do a piece and i go oh yeah that was okay and i go no i could do that better i gotta go back and do it better because it's gonna be out there forever L long after yeah. i've gone this will be out there yeah. so this is very different now as a writer you've yeah. always had that because your written work was a, but for me this is yeah. still quite yeah. new yeah. Yeah. that it's going to be there forever it's not like radio at all radio's disposable yeah. this is the this is the yeah. real thing yeah I find that really interesting as an anthropologist, cultural historian, because for a long time, audio sound was just not seen by scholars. And it was only when it started being recorded, the captured in sound, particularly in the Yugoslav by Albert Lord and Roman Perry in the 1930s, that it could be kind of pinned down and studied and looked at in a very interesting way. Um, but in audio books, it, and the thing about sound is, as you say, it disappears. I wrote a book called Communicating, talking about the different senses and modes of communicating. And that's the big difference between sound and sight. Um, but with audio books, you say they're captured, they're there forever. And that is a real revolution. And I'm really glad to be part of it. I think ACX is great. It, it is. Easy, actually. It, yeah, it's been great for me because my story is... I was uh, in charge of a radio. I also was program director at three different radio stations I worked for over the years. And I was I was in charge of a radio station in London, a fixed radio. And uh, they let me go just before the pandemic. And we were due to go to a trip to oh. New Zealand. We, we went to New Zealand. We came back. But we came back to, to, to a pandemic. And so all of the, <laughs> the jobs I'd advertised applied for and all of the meetings I set up with the BBC and people because I worked for the BBC a lot and whatever nobody just wanted to know no but they just wanted to get through this pandemic thing and, and I said to Julie I said what are we yeah. going to do and she said I What's don't know so so yeah. this was in in May 2020 
I thought, well, I'll have a crack at this audio book thing because I do like reading. I always have. And I thought, I'll have a go at this and see how it goes. And I haven't looked back. You know, since May 2020, I've done nearly 70 audio books. And, and wow. so, yeah, and some of them quite long, you know, some of them 13 hours, 16 hours, 15 hours, wow. and, and a whole, oh, ver whole variety of things, poetry, yeah, sure. fiction, nonfiction, sometimes yeah. biographical yeah. where I have to be, um, like I've yeah. done a lot about um, hard men who, from the northeast of England where I've had to tell their story as them, you know, and just... But just wonderful. They've, it's just been just been great. And, and I and I built this uh, this studio. I had it delivered as a firm in Yorkshire came and delivered this soundproof booth so yeah. I could get got the, the the good sound and the top equipment. And uh, I yeah, haven't looked back. Right. I just love it. Yeah. Yeah, that's so nice. I mean, you're really good at it, and you love doing it. It's true. Well, I hope I'm good at it, and I certainly love doing what I'm doing. And well, we're going to have fun I doing that one together. Much. Doing doing the Helix one together. What we're going to do next, people may be interested in hearing, is the Helix Pearl, which was the, well, really the second main one in the Cape Pearl series, though the third to be written. And it's told by the sea. And to begin with, I thought I would love Graham to read it all. But then I thought, but the sea tells it. So I am the sea. She's a bit pushy, a bit feminist, but quite <laughs> soft inside. But then there are some other bits where the hero is speaking or where it's a kind of outside view rather than the scene and the scene interrupt. Yes, but I was there. I was there from the beginning, you know. It's all very well to say that God created heaven and earth from nothing. He hovered over. What did he hover? Or Hoover, as one person read it. What did he hover over? Me, the sea. So I think it's going to make a great joint collaborative drama really that's going to be great and the others are good you can find them at audible you can find them at itunes you can find them at what's the other one amazon you can find them amazon. there and i'm going to put links if you're watching this on youtube there are links in the comments to to all the books we've mentioned yeah. and as you can see at the top there we've got ruth's website right there my website is down yeah. here i've got an audiobook page on there and uh, and check them out ruth finnegan uh, it's been a pleasure to spend some time with you and this is the first time we've actually seen each other as well we've yes. communicated uh, we've com but, yes and uh, so it's lovely stuff ruth finnegan thank you so much I'm, i hope i didn't ruin your siesta time today it made it a glorious time thank you graham <laughs> Tell me again, O thou of the air, the wind, sing of the girl, of Kate, whose tale was not yet told. Of a man of wrath and cunning wile, and one that loved, and was reject. You saw, you saw the mists of that many sea-gold shore, cross which she fled in olden time. And before all that, O windy spirit thou, Before she fled, An ordinary girl she was, Before, and not afraid, In a magic world she was. She would sit silent there, Feeling the clouds, the sky, Numbering the moons of Jupiter, Fires of the stars, the winds of heaven. She leaped and sang as she flew through heather-scented fragrant air, blown sound from storm-driven waves, fighting and delight the headstrong wind. Ah, joy it was to be alive. You saw, did not forget.